The coronavirus is already in your country, and maybe it's in your neck of the woods. We really don't have a lot of time to prepare. Hello, everyone. This is Chris Martinson. It is Saturday, March 7th, 2020. It's 1 o'clock in the afternoon as I'm recording this. Then uh, it's happening. We are out of time, and uh, it's uh, gotten very serious, and I'm going to run some math with you today that shows you just where we stand. And uh, I know that with the law of odds and averages being what they are, that uh, a lot of people who are listening to this are going to end up being exposed to this virus. It's uh, going to sweep across the world. I expect to be exposed to it. And I think that's a reasonable supposition to have at this particular point in time. Uh, the time to have actually prepared for this was officially was a while ago. Some countries did that. Others chose not to. I live in one of the countries that chose, actively chose, to do an exceptionally poor job uh, coming at this in a serious uh, way. So what do we know about this particular disease and its progression? It goes case, 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 cluster, cluster, boom. Uh, thanks, Ben, for that. Uh, anybody who's uh, – somebody suggested maybe we should make that into a T-shirt. Hey, maybe. Uh, somebody wants to take that on, uh, make a great T-shirt, maybe with a boom on the back. I don't know. So I'm just making light of this because it's getting very, very serious. I had to wait for Italy to update their numbers in order to put this uh, table up here now. So let's take a quick look through it. Um, as you know, I don't believe these numbers at all. We've gotten a few more examples of things leaking out of China. They have a really tight firewall on there data coming out of that right now and sensors and all sorts of penalties, some of them pretty harsh if you are caught uh, trying to sneak out any sort of information, uh, videos or things like that. But still, we're getting some. And, uh, you know, obviously, this thing is not th totally contained and not completely gone away. But China has done a job of showing us and, and done a good job, I think, of containing it as best they can. Of course, you can't completely contain something like this until it burns itself out. Maybe that's seasonal. We don't know. But China has shown that if you really want to uh, go ahead and take this disease out of the story a little bit, you have to be ready, willing, and able to undergo very tight containment, quarantine, isolation actions, all this stuff here. If you want to stop that pandemic, you got to do this. China's done that really, really strongly, and I think they've led the way in showing what needs to be done. None of these other countries are really interested in going down that path. And so they are now grappling with an explosion in cases because they chose preserving their precious stock markets or not wanting to panic people or make sure their real estate markets were good or wanting to make sure that people kept retail shopping. Cho choosing uh, the economy over health, a lot of these countries on this list made that choice, got caught a little flat-footed. <clears throat> South Korea Getting a handle on uh, this is down now, so that's good. And by the way, in Korea, a lot of these cases right here are isolated to a cluster which came through that cult church. And a lot of the people who are in that cult church, somebody pointed out to me today, are young. Uh, it's a, a very much younger denomination of people getting together. So that can help explain this number way over here because, of course, the young are impacted a lot less than the elderly. Italy is on the other end of that particular story here. Look at this, 1,247 cases retaking uh, the number three spot from Iran with that showing right there, uh, 233 deaths and uh, 36 new ones, a lot of active cases still, a huge number of serious critical cases. So Italy is still on very much the upslope of this particular disease, does not have its hands around it yet. Um, and so we'll look at the demographics about that it could explain that a little bit. But Iran, it also has fairly young demographics, but it's getting walloped as well. We don't have great numbers out of Iran. I've seen um, uh, images that I can't necessarily fully qualify uh, and I can't double source, but these appear to be showing mass graves being dug in a variety of locations. And so um, that would not surprise me at all, uh, given the enormity of what's going on there at this point in time. Germany, France, uh, certainly, you know, working their way towards the Thousand Club. Not a lot going on in the Diamond Princess, except it still seems to be shedding cases and somebody, people are undying. So I'm not really clear what's happening there. Um, it, we're looking for the Diamond Princess to give us some, maybe some of our best demographic information about how this disease will actually play out because it was an isolated, contained environment. All right. Um, again, double digits uh, showing up all over the place with Singapore back on the charts, uh, even despite their heroic and really awesome and very inspiring efforts. Um, still cases are popping up now and then just showing 
what a honey badger of a virus this is. And of course, I'm referring to Stoffel, the honey badger. If you haven't seen that video, escapes from any enclosure. Uh, very determined, very persistent, very smart. And uh, so Singapore is certainly showing that. But all of these countries now have uh, a problem on their hand because they are at the case case. Uh-oh, cluster, cluster. And we're, we're right there. So again, when I talked about something not adding up with Italy yesterday with this ridiculously high apparent case fatality rate, uh, I think Carl Wickland at Coffee Trading here um, has put together this really nice chart uh, using some other data, but reassembling it here into high risk, 60 and over, moderate risk, 40 to 59, and low risk uh, buckets right here. And so this is a demographic profile, and these are uh, by five-year groupings, except for the 100 plus. So 95 to 99, 90 to 94. So here you can see in Japan, the proportion of people, so 7.1%, if you could read that, are in that band right there. So just by looking at the general shapes of these things, you might think that Iran actually should be in a fairly low-risk environment for this, but it's getting walloped. Meanwhile, Japan seems to have skated by so far, although there are reports even showing up on uh, major news outlets really questioning whether Japan is testing enough to even know what kind of a predicament it's in and that they may be hiding things because Japan is very worried about, of course, losing their 2020 Olympics, uh, just getting that shafted by this whole coronavirus at this point in time. So Italy, it's number two on this list in terms of having the most high-risk people. Germany, France, you know, these. if you read down this list, you would say... All right, these are the countries that are that are really going to be most at risk, uh, and maybe this explains why you know India's uh, been relatively spared so far, but Iran down here with its very heavy weighting towards low risk people, I don't understand what happened there. So this doesn't it sort of explains the data, maybe, but I'm not totally clear yet. I think we're still going to have to. I think it's going to be two things. We're going to have to understand the demographic profile against the specific strain type that any particular country has or types, and it might be an assorted weighting of those different uh, types that they might have. So maybe Iran has more of a really dominant bad type, and maybe Italy's got a mixture of okay, but more of the bad type, and maybe for whatever reason, Korea, South Korea has more of, of a good type. We don't know that yet. That's just supposition, no idea. By the way, in the United States, there's all this wild flailing. I think uh, our hospital system's gone straight to collapse, skipping uh, you know, any pretense of being able to manage this at all. This came out of Evergreen Health this morning. I believe they took it down right away. The, the, the lashback was instant. Um, and uh, we tweeted about that this morning early. Can I be tested for COVID-19 at an Evergreen Health urgent care or clinic? In partnership with the CDC, they write, we have updated our screening guidelines for COVID-19. We have halted performing nasopharyngeal testing pharyngeal testing in our outpatient clinics, including our urgent care locations. Here's why. CDC has determined that COVID-19 is now endemic, meaning, hey, the virus is now considered to be regularly found in our region and amongst our population. So, you know, what you can do? It's, it's there. You know, it's already here. So, you know, that's uh, that's the reason. Previously, only individuals who had previously known risk factors, including history of travel, exposure to a confirmed case, were considered high risk for acquiring the disease. There is increased risk of transmission when performing any nasopharyngeal testing. So we don't want our healthcare workers to get it. And besides, it's already here. What are you going to do? Right? So that's just giving up. That's just saying we can't do anything about this. And, uh, you know, we're just, we're just out of it. So sorry. Can't, no can do. And um, that's uh, really unfortunate because we've already seen that countries that go through active, aggressive testing, contact tracing, isolation, and quarantine measures – are the ones who are able to slow the progression of this, this disease. And we're going to talk about why that is so important. You may not be able to stop it, but you have to slow it for the good of not collapsing your healthcare system. So we've already seen out here in Washington uh, an urgent care uh, clinic um, saying, yeah, you know, they're just throwing up their hands already uh, went straight to collapse. Didn't even go with uh, overburdened. And because why? Because, well, we have this active policy in the United States, as do many other countries, of don't test, don't tell, right? So Ben Hunt is writing here in Quill on uh, March 6th, really great article. I've just pulled out one small piece about that. And he was writing about how um, all these other countries had managed to make tests. But he writes here, now, that doesn't mean that you can't screw up the coronavirus test if you really set your mind to it. And in fact, that's exactly what the CDC did in January. When they rejected the WHO's proposed test panel for SARS-CoV-2, 
and uh, in favor of a gold-plated test panel of the CDC's own design. After all, why just test for SARS-CoV-2 when you could also test for other SARS and MERS viruses? Unfortunately, with complexity came error, and these initial CDC triple test kits had a flaw in one of the multiple tests ruining the entire test. Now the CDC is producing a solo test for SARS-CoV-2 virus, but this fiasco set us back weeks in test kit supplies. There, we have an explanation for what happened to the test kits. It was a committee got together and decided, well, why wouldn't we go for, you know, all three instead of just one? They they were up against a determined, fast-moving virus, and they decided to go all bureaucratic on it and see what they could do. Now, remember, it was... um, uh, two weeks ago, and I said the next two weeks are critical. A lot depended on what we were going to do. These are the conclusions from that uh, video that came out uh, just a little under two weeks ago. And it said here, one of them was early detection that leads to rapid quarantine is the only way to assure your local hospitals do not get overrun. That should have been the most dominant thing that the CDC, with all their experts on, they should have said, that's what we need. So why wouldn't we go with the simplest, easiest, fastest test kit that we can get out there as soon as possible? Because time is of the essence. And that time got wasted. So this is the difference between the good and the slow, right? Hong Kong doing a good job. Singapore doing a good job. Are they preventing themselves from having cases? No, but look how slowly They're coming out in a measured pace. Your hospital system can keep up with something that looks like that. Whereas over here, we have all these other countries that were kind of on a don't test, don't tell. Hey, we don't really want to know. We don't really want to know. Uh Uh-oh. You know, wash your hands. Uh, Don't use face masks. And boom, off you go. Case, 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 cluster, cluster. Boom. Right? So that's what we're seeing here. And um, uh, this is really an unfortunate Uh, thing that's happened here, and it's happened across all these different countries. Now, the balancing act, of course, remember, if you really want to get that R0 below 1, your non-pharmaceutical interventions, or NPIs here, that lead or tight containment and isolation actions, those those are going to be the only way that you are going to get the the contagion under control, ultimately, right? Or you wait for a virus uh, vaccine to come out or something like that. A lot of countries made the decision that they wanted to keep the economy going, right? And so the World Health Organization became the World Trade Organization. They did the same thing. Why not just keep the economy going? So let's not limit trade. Let's not limit travel. Now countries in Europe are saying, oh, maybe we shouldn't take any more, uh, you know, people traveling through Italy. It's just a day late and a dollar short because what these charts show us is that as soon as you have one patient, it's like cockroaches, not the patients. I mean, the the, the virus, you're going to have hundreds and thousands of them very, very rapidly, you have to make sure that you have the fewest number of cases possible. All right. So uh, given this, I believe that this three-way balancing act is going to have to heavily wait over to this side very soon in the United States. And I'll show you why. And I think other countries as well, this is going to really come at the expense of the economy for a while. And the reason is that I believe Seattle in the United States is not that long away from being swamped. I believe Italy is uh, at the swamp level right now. The next week is going to be really, really difficult for Italy uh, to manage, and they're going to have to start triaging patients, and you're going to see the death counts actually climb because formerly treatable and uh, survivable cases will suddenly become not survivable because of that. I came across this really amazing tweet string today. This is by Liz Specht here, who is an engineer, goes uses numbers and math. Love what she came up with here today. So I wanted to walk everybody through it because I think this ta- talks about how by May, uh, the month of May in the United States, uh, I think it's going to be in deep trouble. And you can just take this same sort of logic and apply it to any country you like. Uh, the Netherlands, the UK, Germany, France. Any, any country where uh, the testing has been poor and the official response was slow, you're going to be facing this same logic train. All right. I think most people aren't aware of the risk of systemic healthcare failure. That's the number one thing I worry about in this overall piece because then you have lots of unnecessary deaths due to COVID-19 because they simply haven't run the numbers yet. Let's talk math. She starts, let's conservatively assume that there are 2,000 current cases in the U.S. today, March 6. This is about 8x the number of official confirmed lab-diagnosed cases. We know there is substantial under-diagnosis due to the lack of test kits. I'll address implications of over-underestimate 
uh, in this in this strain here. Okay, so I think that's a reasonable place to start. Let's let's think there's 2,000 cases. Um, that's probably pretty close to right, uh, especially considering you know in Seattle we know that it was uh, migrating around undetected for six weeks, and uh, so that might is probably low. But that's a reasonable starting point. We can expect that we'll continue to see a doubling of cases every six days. Okay, she's saying this is a typical doubling time across several epidemiological studies. Actually, I think it's less than that, but let's go with six. Here, I mean actual cases. Confirmed cases may appear to rise faster in the short term due to new test kit rollouts. Remember, don't test, don't tell. As we roll out lots of new tests, we're going to have these explosion in cases. So what she's talking about are actual new cases, um, not ones that are already out there just waiting to be discovered. All right. That means we're looking at about 1 million U.S. cases by the end of April, 2 million by May 5th, 4 million by May 11th, and so on. Exponentials are hard to grasp, but this is how they go. That is how they go. So doubling times, they're really hard to get our minds around, but this is how exponentials go. I uh, tweeted out, and I also uh, am uh, doing everything I can to put forward and remind people that I have a uh, YouTube video out there, part of the crash course, which is on um, compounding is the problem. If you look for that, Martinson, compounding is the problem. It's three minutes, 42 seconds of explaining how compounding or exponentials work to help you grasp this because you need to grasp it. Um, we're facing an exponential or, or a geometric disease. So that's what it means. As the healthcare system begins to saturate under this caseload, it will become increasingly hard to detect, track, and contain new transmission chains. That's the issue right there. Of course, as you're, as things get overloaded, you can't detect, track, or contain this thing. So that's why you have to be on this early, fast, and often. That's what Singapore has done. That's what Taiwan has done. That's what South Korea is really aggressively doing. Um, cases like that, you got to get on it really, really fast. In absence of extreme interventions, this likely won't slow significantly until hitting over 1% of susceptible population. That means well over. Okay. So continuing on, what does a caseload of this size mean for the healthcare system? That's the question we should all be asking, especially the healthcare authorities. We'll examine just two factors, hospital beds and masks, among many, many other things that will be impacted. Okay. But let's just look at hospitals, beds, and masks. The U.S. has about 2.8 hospital beds per 1,000 people. With a population of 330 million, it's about a million beds. At any given time, 65% of those beds are already occupied, right? That's just normal stuff, car accidents and um, illnesses and diseases and things like that. So that leaves about 330,000 beds available nationwide, perhaps a bit fewer at this time of the year with regular flu season. Let's trust Italy's numbers and assume that about 10% of cases are serious enough to require hospitalization. And by the way, um, that's I, that's a very light assumption. And the reason for that is, yes, Italy has about uh, 10% here in Sirius. But you, once you've tested people, it's going to take them about a week to progress to Sirius. So you have to actually lag this number a bit. So 10% is low because if we just stopped Italy right now, they didn't get any new cases. We'd actually watch this serious critical number climb as these newly acquired cases transferred from being detectable into being a hospitalizable um, event. So I think 10% is a low ball. So this is, she's given us, Liz has given us a very conservative estimate. Keep in mind that for many patients, hospitalization lasts for weeks. In other words, bed turnover will be very slow as beds will fill with the COVID-19 patients. All right, all very logical so far. By this estimate, by about May 8th, all open hospital beds in the U.S. will be filled. And this says nothing, of course, about whether these beds are suitable for isolation of patients with a highly infectious virus. In fact, of course, they aren't. Um, Most of those beds are totally inappropriate. So, again, very conservative estimate here. If we're wrong by a factor of two regarding the fraction of severe cases, that only changes the timeline of bed saturation by six days in either direction. So, if 20% of cases require hospitalization, we run out of beds by May 2nd. If only 5% of cases require it, We'll make it till May 14th. 2.5% only gets us to May 20th. That's how doublings and exponential things work. So, you know, if it's 2.5% serious rate, you've got until May 20th in this story. If it's 20%, it goes to May 2nd. Otherwise, May 14th for the 5%, right? 
Okay, so um, let's see here. This, of course, assumes there's no uptick in demand for beds from other non-COVID-19 causes, which seems like a dubious assumption, and it is. So thank you for pointing that out. As healthcare system becomes increasingly burdened, uh, our X shortages, so uh, uh, drug shortages, etc., people with chronic conditions that are normally well-managed may find themselves slipping into severe states of medical distress, requiring intensive care and hospitalization, but let's ignore that for now. All right, so that's beds. Now masks. Feds say we have a national stockpile of 12 million N95 masks and 30 million surgical masks, which are not ideal, but better than nothing. We pointed that out yesterday. The CDC even said better than nothing. There are about 18 million healthcare workers in the U.S. Let's assume only 6 million healthcare workers are working on any given day. It's likely an underestimate as most people work most days a week. But again, I'm playing conservative at every turn. As COVID-19 cases saturate virtually every state and county, which seems likely to happen any day now, it will soon be irresponsible for all healthcare workers to not wear a mask. These healthcare workers would burn through the N95 stockpile in two days if each healthcare worker got one mask per day. One per day would be neither sanitary nor pragmatic, though this is indeed what we saw in Wuhan, with healthcare workers collapsing on their shift from dehydration because they were trying to avoid changing their PPE suits as they cannot be reused. All right. How quickly could we ramp up production of new masks? Not very fast at all. The vast majority are manufactured overseas, almost all in China, even when manufactured here in the U.S. Raw materials are predominantly from overseas, again, predominantly from China. Keep in mind that all countries globally will be going through the exact same crises and shortages simultaneously and we can't force trade in our favor. And we've already seen Germany has uh, stopped the export of their uh, critical hospital materials, and Thailand is uh, taking all of its mass production for its own uses, on and on and on, right? Very, very ordinary expected things. All right, now consider how these two factors, bed and mass shortages, compound each other's severity. Full hospitals plus few masks plus healthcare workers running around between beds without proper PPE equals a very bad mix. Healthcare workers are already getting infected even with access to full PPE. Absolutely true. In the face of PPE limitations, this is severe. It's only a matter of time. Oh, with limitations this severe, it's only a matter of time. Healthcare workers will start dropping from the workforce for weeks at a time, leading to a shortage of healthcare workers, which then further compounds both issues above. We could go on and on about thousands of factors like numbers of ventilators or even simple things like saline drip bags, but you see where this is going, right? Importantly, I cannot stress this enough, even if I'm wrong, even very wrong about core assumptions like percent of severe cases or the current case number, it only changes the timeline by days or weeks. This is how exponential growth in an immunologically naive population works. Even if the core assumptions are badly off, it only changes the timeline by days or weeks. And this is the, this is the, the, the absolute most important sense. This is how exponential growth in an immunologically naive population works. Big gold star, if I can draw one for that. Um, this, is, this is absolutely the case. And since I know about exponential growth, because I've been talking about it and teaching about it for a long time, I think this just appeared to me as, uh, this is why it jumped out at me so much earlier than I, maybe for other people, is because I understand what that language means in immunolo immunologically naive population. That means a population without herd immunity. And I also understand exponential growth. And if you can do that, if you can do the math, these things just jump out at you. It's just an instant conclusion, right? Undeserved panic does no one any good, but neither does ill-informed complacency. It's wrong to assuage the public by saying only 2% will die. People aren't adequately grasping the national and global systemic burden wrought by this swift moving of a disease. Absolutely pure gold on that statement as well. I'm an engineer. I tr this is what my mind does all day. I run back of the envelope calculations to try and estimate order of magnitude impacts. Close enough, good enough, right? I've been on high alarm about this disease since January 19th after reading clinical indicators in the first papers emerging from Wuhan. So got on it early. Congratulations. Nothing in the past six weeks has dampened my alarm in the slightest. Me neither. 
To the contrary, we're seeing abject refusal of many countries to adequately respond or prepare. And of course, some of these estimates will be wrong, even substantially wrong. And that's absolutely the case. You go with what you can and you make your best guesses and you got to make decisions anyway. But I have no reason to think there'll be orders of magnitude wrong. Even if your personal risk of death is very, very low, don't mock decisions like canceling events or closing workplaces as undue panic. And I want you to trust yourself on this. Case, case, cluster, cluster, boom. That boom stage catches everybody by surprise. By the time you have clusters, it's around you. It's in places where you can't see and people are carrying it asymptomatically who you can't detect. And so that's the worst of it. And of course, if we had active testing and active transparent public communication, this is a very different story, right? If you knew who had it, where they got it, where they had been, that's a very different story from having no clue who's got it or, uh, you know, is it the person next to you? I mean, it's that lack of uh, uh, certainty that's a killer here. These measures are the bare minimum we should be doing to try to shift the peak, to slow the rise in cases so that healthcare systems are less overwhelmed. Each day that we can delay, an extra case is a big win for the healthcare system. Absolutely right. That is absolutely correct. And yes, you should really prepare to buckle down for a bit. Also correct. All services and supply chains will be impacted. Why risk the stress of being ill-prepared? Worst case, I'm massively wrong and you now have a huge bag of rice and black beans to burn through over the next few months and enough Robitussin to trip out. Congratulations. That was just a perfect summary. That's why I wanted to take you through that. It actually makes a lot of sense. And I had people immediately uh, jump in and say that this is alarmist and this is fear porn and all of that other stuff. And these are people who are having a slow adjustment reaction. There's not, they're, they're not bad people. They just are unable to either process math, they don't get it, or they have a belief system that prevents them from facing and confronting this sort of information now. And you've always seen that person in the movie, the person who, you know, can't quite adjust and is still making the bed while the nuclear bombs are, are going off, you know, because they, they need that normality. But here's the deal. If facts alarm you, the problem isn't with the facts. It's with your adjustment reaction or lack thereof uh, in, in this case. All right. I think uh, this was a comment that I found under yesterday's video, and um, it reinforces this You're On Your Own, which was a title of a video I put out about a week ago. And uh, this person, Amaya Godbol, from, uh, I'm from India. I grew up watching House MD and Grey's Anatomy and always envied the portrayed quality of U.S. healthcare facilities. Now, not so much. U.S. has access to the latest technologies, procedures, healthcare apparatus, talent, and yet all of these combined form a system that does not value human life. The whole is supposed to be greater than the sum of its parts, not the other way around. If my country and government does drops the ball, it can be um, it can be scrounged for some valid excuses. It can scrounge for some valid excuses. What excuse does the U.S. government have? Lack of money? Lack of infrastructure? No, it's a lack of will. It's a lack of compassion. It's lack of value for human life. It's lack of humanity. I love American Americans. You don't deserve this. Expect more, demand more. Good luck. And I think that captures it really well. The whole shining city on a hill is being exposed. Uh, There's a lot of rot in this system. And it's about power and it's about money. And I believe the slow response we saw was because we had people in power who were more concerned about not spooking markets and keeping commerce going than they cared about human life and humanity itself. Well, guess what? This virus don't care, right? Uh, This just came out um, March 6th, so that came out yesterday. IPAC, the big uh, IPAC conference, says two people at DC conference attended by Pence and others, yep, lots of others, have tested positive for coronavirus. Um, the American Israel Public Affairs Committee told conference attendees, some of whom include lawmakers, that at least two conference goers have tested positive for coronavirus. The pro-Israel lobbying group said in an updated statement to attendees, speakers, administration, and Capitol Hill offices on Friday that the two individuals affected traveled from New York to Washington, D.C. to attend the March 1-3 through conference. Attendees and speakers at the conference include VP Mike Pence, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, Ted Cruz here, Liz Cheney, and former 2020 Democratic candidate Mike Bloomberg, blah, blah. All right. Cory Booker, I didn't mean to blah, blah, blah him, but several of the lawmakers, right? It's, It's... 
This is huge. About 18,000 people attend its conference. So uh, this is uh, just a giant thing. But it hit – the point I'm making here is it hit right at the heart of, uh, of the leadership structure here. And that brings me to my three conclusions and two opinions that I'm going to close out here with today. The conclusions are it's just too late to prevent a bad outcome for all this in the boom countries, right? The time for that was a month ago, at least. We should have been having active testing and we should have shut down travel right away and we should have had active quarantining of all inbound people from host countries. I, the United States, I believe, is still – you can still fly back from Italy right now. You can still fly back from South Korea. There's like It's still not in place. The testing isn't serious enough at this point in time. Nobody has an answer for how people are going to be tested and who's going to pay for it and and what are the criteria. The criteria is still all a mess. The whole thing is a shit show at this point in time. And so the bad outcome is all but assured at this point in time. First, local hospitals, maybe in Seattle, say, they're going to get swamped within a week or two. Nationally, um, say, the nation's in a massive crisis by early to mid-May, according to the stuff that Liz put out there up in, in this, Liz Specht. Uh, and you need to expect now, You this is part of your planning process, you need to expect that draconian measures or what will feel draconian are going to be implemented, right? So I'm talking about full quarantines. We've already seen in the United States that we have police out in California that are surrounding a, an area and uh, quarantining it right now. That's going to continue. This will probably include National Guard, maybe the military at some point. We don't know, right? When? Probably right around the time when the hospitals that the currently powerful people, and a lot of people are going to lose their jobs, I hope, over this, uh, the ones that the currently powerful people use become swamped. That's when they care, right? You know when they care? When it begins to impact them. That's when they start to care. That's what happens in a in a culture that's lost its way. Um so this is this virus is going to it's exposing an astonishing degree of hubris of incompetence and a complete lack of concern for humans um or just basic care and and that's that's why I think people are struggling with like how could it be this bad well it can only be this bad if you got a ton of hubris incompetence and complete lack of human care i mean it's just it's it you know that's the nature of it guess what it didn't have to be this way this was all completely obviously um, preventable, foreseeable, things like that. People like Liz were able to see it uh, back in January early on. I was able to see it. Other people um, we know were able to see this. Uh, Eric Townsend, um, uh, Jim Bianco, people, there's just a ton of people saw it, but um, nobody wanted to hear what we were saying at the time. And, and, and it's not sour grapes, and I'm not bitter about that. I'm just observing it, but it really is a sign, I think. And my conclusion of that is that um, – We've really lost our, our way in this story and that people were unable to set aside um, their bureaucratic inertia, their fear for saying the wrong things, their uh, inability to uh, basically be bold and do their jobs appropriately. Um, that's what got exposed here. Remember, this isn't the flu. It's not SARS. And also remember to resubscribe if you have to because we're getting reports all the time of people who are being unsubscribed very unhelpfully by this channel from this channel by uh, by Google, by YouTube, um, because, I don't know, data and logic and uh, numbers uh, scare them for some reason. But remember, if the facts alarm you, Google, uh, the problem isn't with the facts. Uh, that's with your own lack of adjustment process around that. So with that, thank you very much. I'm going to be taking tomorrow off, and uh, we'll be back uh, with you on Monday. Thank you very much for listening. Hi, folks. Adam Taggart here. Chris Martinson and I are the co-founders of Peak Prosperity. If you want to get alerted whenever we release a new video from Chris, just click the red subscribe button right beneath the YouTube video player. Once you've done that, a little bell icon will appear right next to it. Click on that bell. It looks like this. And that's it. The next time we publish a video from Chris, you'll immediately receive a notification from YouTube. Thanks for watching our videos.